much for opportunity to speak and for very work for inviting me. And we're going to do a cosmic detour from the large scale of planets to the small uh, micro and nano world of molecules. And I think this is as far as as we can go uh, from the mainstream deep learning in uh, speech, text, and we, what we try to do is to apply the machine learning for the chemical objects and molecules. Basically, what I will try to give you a tour within my 15 minutes of time and give you a flavor. Uh, what kind of chemical data we work, uh, how, we, how we, yes, how do we uh, represent the molecule of learning and uh, what's applications been done in our field and I'll give you a brief overview about our efforts to design a new generation of cheminformatic platform and I will close with some benchmark and case studies time permitting. Uh, in fact, chemistry has a long history of applying machine learning problems, and many people didn't realize that. So uh, there's a, we've been doing machine learning for, and data science for per se, for long before it became a sexy and trendy field. And we call it uh, cheminformatics, which is chemistry and informatics, exactly what's labeled on the tin. And we deal with the molecules uh, in this high dimensional uh, space defined by the features, or as we call them, descriptors. So uh, the goal of our work is to navigate through this space uh, of the molecule, and looking for a new drug, new molecule of interest with particular tailored properties. So it's been estimated that the, in fact, the space of the possible uh, unique molecules is huge, up to the 10 to the 60. The space of the drug-like molecules, 10 to the 33, it's still this is insanely large number. And uh, to put things into perspective, this is the uh, on order of magnitude of number of atoms in the whole galaxy. So this is amazingly large numbers. And down, there are many, many orders of magnitudes. We have a space of known data. So currently, about 100 million molecules have been synthesized and tested. So 10 to the 8 is known molecules. For about 1 million of them, we know at least one biological properties or activity. So the goal of cheminformatics is to try to bridge this gap between all this order of magnitudes and try to find the efficient way how to look for the new molecules and new chemistry. However, what's been motivated us uh, quite strongly, it's rather depressing trend. So in decline pharmaceutical R&D efficiency, so essentially what the graph shows you, there is a number of drugs on the market per one billion of R&D spending and budget. And for past 60 years, we have this steady linear decline the number of drugs per you know, dollar amount of spending. And if you continue and extrapolate this graph for 20 or so years, you end up in the situation when the, no matter how big pharma company is this, there is, uh, we'll have not enough money to bring a new drug on the market. So there will be no new drug, which is a very unfortunate situation. And the goal of our work is to look for new data-driven methods that would mitigate this, this trend and would apply some data mining and machine learning methods, uh, find uh, new effective solutions. So how we do represent the molecules for learning? And you know, if you hate chemistry in, in, in school, just bear with me. Uh, so let's take an example of simple molecule. When molecules interact with each other and see each other, the view in terms of you know, favorable interaction, electrostatic field is more convenient in other place. As a chemist, 
we prefer to draw a structure, bonds, and atoms. However, for the purpose of learning and a computer, molecule is usually uh, represented as a graph, where in this graph, every atom is a node, and two nodes combined uh, with the edge, so bond is an edge. Then uh, this graph, typically stored in uh, standardized format, we have a connectivity table, uh, coordinates of the atom, and some other additional information. So based on this graph, so molecular descriptors or features are extracted, and there are a million ways how to do it, and I'll show you just one. It's called uh, molecular fingerprints. And in a nutshell, this is a fixed uh, bit string vector that encodes uh, particular features. For example, it can be binary, zero, one, that indicate us about the presence of particular fragment or feature. And uh, then all of this combined uh, in the workflow, what we called a virtual screening, because everything done in, on a computer, uh, typically we design a molecular database, then apply some empirical filters, molecular uh, uh, machine learning models, we screen this database and identify the top hits. Typically top hits that would be the strongest inhibitor, the molecules that would interact uh, most strongly with the particular protein, and we discard the 99% of the junk molecules. Essentially, for these top candidates, we identify you know, the uh, one interaction with one biological uh, endpoint with one protein. But nature is very complicated, and of course, uh, knowledge that this molecule interacts with the, with the drug is not enough. That's why uh, there is a really a, a great opportunity for the multitask uh, neural networks, where we can apply and, and train one neural net one new neural net model that would simultaneously uh, uh, produce uh, you know, multiple tasks and multiple answers. Here is one of the first studies from the Toronto group. What they did, uh, they took a bunch of uh, different proteins and they trained uh, different models. I apologize, it's maybe hard to see. Basically, this table gives you accuracy in terms of AUC, area under the curve. So the first column is random forests and boosting trees, the single, single task neural nets and multitask neural nets. So they predicted for this uh, set of different proteins. And essentially, for this random forest and boosting trees and single task neural net, they all perform equally. There's some uh, insignificant difference. But only for the multitask neural nets, they get a significant boost and st statistically significant in the performance. And those numbers are indicated in bold. You can see there are many places where the model benefited from this mutual e exchange of information between different tasks. And very recently, there is other study from Stanford and Google. And, and Google, they have lots of computational resources. So they did massively multitask study. It, they took up to the 250 different proteins and trained uh, this huge model. And what this figure shows you, this is delta AUC. This is the relative improvements of the model for every individual task uh, of the multi, uh, multitask model uh, versus the single task model. But what's interesting, the results of this study were more conservative. Essentially, what they found out for the smaller amount of task multitask model performs poorly. There is no improvement. And uh, so the, the, black, uh, the black line would be the average between different tasks. And improvement is observed only for the large number of tasks. And in their cases, improvement was not, not that great as well. So what we do at UNC, we try to come up with a uh, design of new generation of chemoinformatics platform that would work with the much larger data sets that became available right now from billions and 
hundreds of billions of molecules. For that, we utilize a lot of GPU computing. It's really awesome. We like the, so you can do the masterly parallel computation, high throughput computing, and rapidly screen those very large data sets. But we also would like to combine that with the deep learning architecture. So instead of prediction one endpoint, we're going to predict the whole biological profile. I'm running a little bit late. So uh, it's still work in progress. Right now, the, the library consists from three parts. First is the data processing. Took the chemical library, which is typically the text file, the high throughput computation of this, those features, store them, compact binary, indexed format. Second part is this, is this similarity search functionality. And it's very important for the chemical application. We can do clustering, we can generate diversity sets, we can identify uh, duplicates. And again, here we use a lot of GPU computing, so the GPU accelerated search uh, can, can process hundreds of millions of molecules on a single GPU in one second. And finally, let's combine with the predictive modeling part. Here we use a couple of uh, of the shelf available uh, machine learning library. And we also implemented uh, deep neural nets based on Tiana, which again run on GPU. And all of that combined allow us to do this really high throughput screening of this large, large chemical data set. Then we screen 200 millions of compound library, which is the largest library we can ha put our hands on. And we identified that 1.4 million of molecules actually can be potential uh, candidates uh, for the inhibitors. Would, the, would it make them a drug? Of course, no. Uh, because when we, when we apply those uh, additional tasks and uh, uh, additional constraints for this, uh, including uh, there is enough sensitivity of target binding, toxicity, all, all the additional constraints, we end up with 100 molecule candidates. So this multitask model are really good and useful for essentially looking this needle in the high, haystack of this huge chemical space. And now the second application, it's fresh from the oven results from last week. Uh, what we try to do, we try to uh, uh, do very accurate prediction of the, of, the of the properties of the molecule. Here is an example for the melting temperature. And the, this, this property is essential for the drug formulation, and it's, there's a great practical use for that. The current state of the art for this model, so the mean absolute area is 32 degrees and uh, R square for the, for the regression, 0.74. What we're able to achieve, we train and uh, deep neural nets, there's some uh, architecture information, and predicted this almost 50,000 molecules. And we were able to reduce the error by 22%. What we end up with uh, mean absolute error of 25 degrees, and R square is over 0.8. And this, you see the actual predicted versus uh, observed uh, regression. Finally, uh, I'd like to acknowledge a lot of people who contribute to this work, support from NVIDIA funding. And hopefully, I was able to convince you that there are really exciting opportunities for the deep learning very far from typical vision, text, and speech. Thank you very much for your attention.